Bibles, please, to the book of Titus in the New Testament. Titus chapter 2. You can find it on page 1198. And it's always useful to keep it, keep it open while I'm speaking. So Titus chapter 2, reading from verse 1. You, however, must teach what is appropriate to sound doctrine. Teach the older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled, and sound in faith, in love, and in endurance. Likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanderers or addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good. Then they can urge the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled and pure, to be busy at home, to be kind and to be subject to their husbands, so that no one will malign the word of God. Similarly, encourage the young men to be self-controlled. In everything, set them an example by doing what is good. In your teaching, show integrity, seriousness and sounds of speech that cannot be condemned so that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. Teach slaves to be subject to their masters in everything, to try to please them, not to talk back to them, and not to steal from them, but to show that they can be fully trusted so that in every way they will make the teaching about God our Saviour attractive. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. These, then, are the things you should teach. Encourage and rebuke with all authority. Do not let anyone despise you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for those words that come to us down the years. They are as relevant now as on the day the Holy Spirit dictated them. So we say, come Holy Spirit, read those words into our hearts afresh. Grant to me the ability to open them up and all our hearts to receive what you would say to us. Father, we thank you. Through Jesus. Amen. Amen. We're making our way through Paul's letter to Titus. And we're in chapter 2, where Paul is instructing Titus as to what he should teach to the different groups within the church in his charge. In the past few weeks, we've looked at what should be taught to older men and women, to younger women and men. We've seen how our lives must have integrity. We need to practice what we preach. And this week, we come to a somewhat controversial subject. What should be taught to slaves? And we view the concept of slavery through the lens of the transatlantic slave trade, an abomination of cruelty. But we need to remember that when Paul was writing, slavery in the first century was a wholly different matter. In Greek and Roman society, slavery was a respectable institution. It didn't depend on race, 
whatever race, whatever background, whatever language you spoke, you could be a slave. There was nothing to do with that. Yes, slaves were the property of their masters. But, but back then, slaves could own property. Slaves even owned other slaves. And they didn't just do manual work. There were often teachers, doctors, administrators, property stewards, all sorts. And one, old, one, one, old, one ancient writer said, tells us that some slaves were better educated than their masters. They were able to save money and buy their freedom. And many were free by the age of 30. It wasn't a pleasant state. Their masters did have the right of life and death over them. But if you were to injure or kill one of your slaves, then they were worthless. So why do it? It's estimated that up to a third of the population, when Paul was writing, were slaves. In fact, some people sold themselves into slavery to better their lot, because they'd be educated, they'd be better fed. So it was vastly different to slavery in the America, Americas 300 years ago. Now, Paul doesn't condone or condemn slavery. Back then, it was a long-established part of society. And whilst in 1 Corinthians 7, Paul does tell slaves that if they can gain their freedom, they should do so, he also tells Titus to teach them to be subject to their masters in everything. Verse 9. So slavery was an established fact, it was a part of everyday life. And as a normal part of life, it was more important that they find Jesus than get their freedom on earth. This life is short. The things of this life are temporary. Paul was concerned with eternity. Because that's what counts. Not this life now. So many people are focused on the now. So many people are worried about the future. God wants us to live under the perspective of eternity. If we are his people, then he'll get us through all that we've got to face in the coming days, the coming weeks, the coming years. And in the end, we have a place in heaven in the presence of God. And eternity is a very, very long time. So for this reason, Paul could write in 1 Corinthians 7, Were you a slave when Jesus called you? Don't let it trouble you. And then he continues, For the one who was a slave when called to faith is the Lord's freed person. Similarly, the one who was free when called, is Christ's slave. And then he reminds, then he reminds them, and he reminds us, that everyone who comes to believe in Jesus was bought at a price. We are no longer our own. If you've accepted Jesus, we were bought at a price. The very life blood of Jesus shed on the cross for you. Jesus paid for you with himself. That's how valuable you are to God. That Jesus died for you. He paid the price of giving himself all the agony of the cross for you. Before we accepted Jesus, whether we like it or not, we were all enslaved to sin. We look at our lives and are honest. No one is perfect. 
we all fall short of the glory of God in some way. And that's without exception. And Jesus warns us in John chapter 8 that whoever commits sin, whoever sins, is a slave to sin. It's powerful, it's addictive, and it's deadly. But Jesus has redeemed us through the cross. He has paid the price for our sin. And he's paid that price to set us free from sin and death. We were slaves to sin, and Jesus has made it possible for all to be set free, if we will come to him, if we will believe, if we will submit our entire lives to him. So if you've accepted Jesus tonight, and I trust you have, because it's the best thing that you will ever do, but you have to actively accept. He's a perfect gentleman. You have to invite him. You have to call on the name of Jesus. And we owe him a debt of infinite gratitude. Because Jesus paid the price for you and for me with his own death. And he wants us to be his willing slaves. Because in accepting his lordship over us, then we find real freedom. So Paul's attitude to slavery actually turns it on its head. Christian slaves were to serve, but not their earthly masters. They were to submit to them, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. They were to serve wholeheartedly, as if they were serving the Lord, not people, Ephesians 6. They were to regard themselves as serving God. Now I said that Paul's attitude to slavery turns it on its head, because he also commands Christian slave owners to treat their slaves, realising that they too had a master, God himself. They must not threaten them since they know that he who is both the master of the slaves, Jesus, is theirs too. And he is in heaven and there's no favouritism with him. Paul was calling on both slaves and masters who claim to be Christian to show Christian principles in their relationships and thereby the institution of slavery was to be transformed from within. And if a slave owner was truly Christian, then I'm sure they would want to set their slaves free. But as I said, it was a different world 2,000 years ago. Slaves were to obey their masters. But in Colossians 4, he told the masters to provide their slaves with what is right and fair. Again, because they know that they have a master in heaven, Colossians 4. They were to please God first. And that should be expressed in love and mutual respect. And that goes for our relationships today. So in Titus 2, Paul tells Titus to teach slaves to be subject to their masters in everything, to try to please them, not to talk back to them, and not to steal from them, but to show that they can be fully trusted. This is the reason, so that in every way they will make the teaching about God, our Saviour, attractive. Paul's priority for Titus is not social justice, those who in the church were slaves. They were to commit themselves to God who loved them, to God in whose hands they were kept. They were to willingly subject themselves to their masters, to try to please them, 
not to talk back to them, and not to steal from them. And this wasn't because Paul supported slavery. It was because his priorities were the same as Jesus in our first reading. In Matthew 5, Jesus spoke to his followers, saying, You are the light of the world. All believers, slave or free, master or servant, man, woman or child, whether we like it or not, all, all true believers are the light of the world. When we were slaves to sin, we were darkness. But Jesus has redeemed us and set us free. He's washed our sins away. He washed all the darkness away with his own blood. He brought us out of darkness into his marvellous light. When we first believed, when we first committed ourselves to him, we were forgiven. We were born again. We were born of the Spirit and illuminated. God lit a flame in our hearts by his Spirit and made us to shine as God's people. You are the light of the world. And if you claim the name of Jesus tonight, and that is your role, that is your purpose, to shine for him. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a bowl. A light is meant to shine, not be hidden away. A light is put on a stand so that it gives light to everyone in the house. And then Jesus continues, in the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. It's an uncomfortable thing, but God's purpose is not, first of all, for our comfort. It's for the salvation of other human beings. Remember that Peter wrote that it's not God's desire that anyone should perish. Rather, he wants all to come to repentance. And repentance means a, a turning from sin, a change of mind, a turning to God, whoever we are. He wants all to come to repentance, to come to faith in Jesus. He wants all to have that fire lit in their hearts. But for that to happen, people have to see the reality of Jesus. Faith comes from hearing the message of the Gospel, Romans 10. And it's the task and the purpose of God's people to bear witness to Jesus, both in our words and in our behaviour and our attitudes. Jesus wants all his people to shine. He wants all his people to bear witness to him, to the reality of him. Back then it was slave or free, master or servant, man or woman. Wherever we are, whatever situation we find ourselves in, he wants us to let our light shine before others. So let your sharp light shine before others, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. He wants people to see the reality of our faith, the reality of Jesus. He doesn't want us to do good works to get saved, because you'll never do enough good works to get saved. He wants us to do good works because we are His. Because we love Him. Because we walk with Him. Because we've been forgiven. And because we know that that light is burning within us. And it's for that reason that Paul tells Titus to teach slaves to be subject to their masters in everything. 
to try to please them, not to talk back to them, and not to steal from them, but to show they can be fully trusted, so that in every way they will make the teaching about God, our Saviour, attractive. Verses 9 and 10. God's purpose is beyond ours. He wants everyone to come to repentance. He isn't primarily interested in our comfort. He's first and foremost interested in the salvation of humanity. Now, I worked for Doncaster Council for 15 years. I worked in a large, ungodly office. And let me tell you, most of the time I absolutely hated it. But I knew God wanted me to be there. Because there were only, as far as I knew, it was on the four floors of the building, there were only three Christians. And there were about a hundred people on each floor. God wanted me there to shine. Mm -hmm. But half the time I didn't, some of the time I did. God, God wants all of us to shine. He loves the masters of the slaves as much as he loves the slaves themselves. God wanted both to come to Jesus. And it was for that reason that he wanted the Christian slaves to show they could be fully trusted. So that in every way they will make the teaching about God, our Saviour, attractive. That's God's priority. That's what he wanted for them, that they might shine. That's what he wants for us, 2,000 years later. So whatever situation that we find ourselves in, be it good or bad, be it easy or hard, Whatever situation God's people find themselves in, he says, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. He wants our lives to shine, to show in our act actions that we are God's people, so that in every way, we might make the teaching about God, our Saviour, attractive. There are people who might never, never see another genuine Christian. They might go through their lives without meeting someone that knows Jesus. They need to see the light in you. For you, because of Jesus, are the light of the world. This isn't an easy message. God wanted slaves to shine for their masters. He wanted Christian masters to shine for their slaves. It's the responsibility of all God's people to shine, to be genuine, to be who we are in Christ. That in our lives, the evidence of the reality of Jesus might be displayed. It may cost us. It may not be easy. But he calls us, just the same as he called those slaves on Crete, to live rightly, to live in love, to shine, and in that way, make the teaching about God, our Saviour, attractive. I'm going to leave you with a couple of questions. Is that fire burning in your heart tonight? If it isn't, get down on your knees and ask Jesus to forgive you. To be your Lord and to kindle a fire that will never go out. What do people see in your life and character? Do you shine? Or do you hide your light under a bowl? Does your life make the teaching about Jesus attractive? Not just to those who like you, because that's easy. 
but even to those who hate you. What does your life say? And what are you going to do about it? Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you that you gave Jesus to die for our sin. The perfect Lamb of God offered himself for us, for me. And his blood can make the foulest clean. Father, we thank you that we were bought at a price that we were worth that, the, the, the life and death of Jesus, your Son, is what we're worth to you. Father, we thank you for the high value that you place upon us. And as your children, so we offer ourselves to you afresh, asking that you cause us to shine, that you so work in our lives, who we might be armed with the right attitude. So we're there to serve you, to honour you first. That our lives might shine for others. Father, make us, make this church a beacon, a beacon in this dark world of fear. Father, we thank you. Through Jesus.